Hello and welcome to the Health Odyssey podcast, episode 171. Now, we are joined today uh, by a very, very special guest who I'll introduce you to in a minute. Um, it's actually his third visit with us. Um, kind of all on a, all the kind of conversations we've had have been on a similar theme, but this is going to be a really interesting uh, conversation and a really positive conversation as well, which is going to be which is going to be great. But before I introduce you to our guest, let me just check in with uh, Mr. Peter Lant. How are you doing, Pete? I'm doing I'm doing very well. I'm I'm. Well, I haven't spoke about this yet. I didn't mention this, but I'm nearly there. I've got 147,000 steps left to do, and I've got me six million for the year. So excellent. So is and that, that is fits that well with of, today as well? Is that ahead of schedule? Ahead of are you are you ahead of the the kind well, of? Yeah, I said I would do six million this year, so I'll be done. 100. I'll do 140,000 by next next week. So potentially, then you could you could be done before the start of December. Oh, easy, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'll be okay. done, what is it, 19th, 20th, 21st, 22nd, 23rd. Like, I'll be done by the 23rd or something. So I'm Excellent. definitely going to get six and a half million. I was going to aim for seven. Mm. But then, actually, that's like, it was like 22 or 23,000 steps a day when I've been averaging 18. Mm. So it's it's a bit more. Yeah. <laughs> so in December as well. But I might, I might, I might we'll see. Six and a half seven. million, six and a half million sounds good. It's honestly, yeah. I'm, I'm, it, it's been, it's been brilliant doing that this year. I've loved it. Excellent. Well, we are joined, obviously, it's myself and uh, Pete today, and we are joined for the third time by uh, Chris Branch. How are you doing, Chris? I'm really well, thanks. Um, I'm really chuffed to be back and excited to be talking about happier topics today. So yeah, really pleased <laughs> to be back. <laughs> yeah. So if you are, I know we are getting some new listeners and, and some people have been speaking to me recently who've kind of recently found the podcast and, and are listening now, but uh, Chris has been uh, on with us twice before um, in fairly recent times, actually. So the two episodes Chris has been on before episode 145 and episode 149. And you can very, very easily find those now on healthoddity.com uh, because we've got every single episode on there in audio and in video as well. Uh, if you want to go back and listen to those, which I probably would recommend you do. I mean, you will obviously get a lot from this episode as a standalone as well, because I'm sure it's going to be fascinating. But if you do want to go back and listen to episodes 145 and episodes 149 with Chris, then that would be really good because that would probably kind of set up and tee up this episode and what we're going to be talking about, uh, you know, and it will really kind of, it's almost like a trilogy, you know, this is closing out the trilogy, I suppose, on this particular topic. And I'm sure we'll speak to Chris again um, around other things. Um, but yeah, Chris, so so when we spoke to you last time, we were kind of unpacking um, a, a 100 mile run attempt that you uh, that you did, which was uh, uh, ultimately, I suppose, unsuccessful in hitting the initial goal you started out from. But you learned a hell of a lot from it. Um, so yeah, do you want to kind of tell us a little bit about what's been going on with you since that last episode? Because I know when we spoke, you said, uh, you know, you were kind of just kind of processing everything still. It was very early on after the, the last one. And then kind of what happened to your, your mindset? And then how did you decide to move forward? And what did you decide to do on the back of the last attempt? If we can start from there. Yeah, well, I started the year with the strong goal of uh, trying to achieve a 100 mile race. And um, that's where that's where you and I've spoken twice. And the first one was building the preparation for the for the attempt. And then second one, I'd just done it. And there were quite a few factors involved that meant that I couldn't do it. And it really knocked me for quite a while, actually, more than I was expecting at the time. And I figured I'd always planned after that race to move slightly away from long distance stuff for the rest of the year so that race was in June and I'd intended to have a bit of a strength block between then and Christmas and I started that so at in the mid-June I went into some more strength training started to build a bit of muscle back that continued through till about late August and um, I was really enjoying myself feeling really good about it and I have a big race in the diary in May 2024 and that was it I was just going to leave leave my long distance escapades until next year and I walked into a coffee shop just to go and treat myself to a coffee got chatting to someone and they told me about a 100 mile race around a running track 
And it just landed in my brain as a very bizarre, but interesting and intriguing thing to do. And I left that coffee shop having signed up to a 100 mile race. <laughs> so <laughs> could I ask, did you, did you know this person that you bumped? That it was, it, it, was it just total stranger you had this conversation with? I, or? I did know this person. Yeah. Okay. They are, they are <laughs> in the, <laughs> they are in the ultra running community. Um, so but I had no, I had no idea that I was going to walk into the coffee shop that day and start talking about ultras and leave having booked a 100 mile race. Um, I've read about track long distance stuff in a book called The Rise of the Ultra Runners, which is a, if anyone's interested in getting into long distance running, it's definitely a book I recommend. And in that book, he does a track 24 hour race, which is run as far as you can in 24 hours. The race he did was called Self Transcendence. And it's called that because there's a point in the race that he spoke about, which is where people just seem to transcend beyond the physical challenge of it. And it almost becomes a spiritual journey. And he wrote really beautifully about it. And it always kind of was something in the back of my mind that I thought if I had the opportunity to try that, I'd give it a go. So uh, when I had failed the, the first 100 mile attempt, it's still in the same calendar year. It feels like I had some real unfinished business with the hundred mile distance. And I remember reading this book when I heard about the track 100, it just landed. So I, I signed up to it. So uh, that that was two weeks ago. And and uh, this time around, thankfully, I was successful. So I suppose um, where, where was the location of the of the of the race? It was. It was Huntingdon near Cambridge. It, it's one of those things where it just doesn't matter because once you're on the track, <laughs> there's there's nothing else there. And it, I think deliberately he chose a track that just, I guess, from a cost perspective as well, it wasn't a big track with a big stadium or anything. It was it was just a very typical council track with not a lot there. And logistically, it makes it quite easy for a, for a, from a race perspective. You just take your box of food and spare clothing and take a little camping chair put it down by the side and, and once you're on the track that's all you that's you're there for the next little no the, re the reason i asked was because i know i saw you've done a, a, a fantastic um youtube kind of summary uh, of it which we'll 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 probably share on our you know facebook and all the rest of it um but i watched that uh obviously yesterday i think prior to prior to coming on with you and the track we'll, we'll get to it i know because i don't want to kind of jump ahead but there was a bit in the video where you're running and you see like a sunrise and it did just look like a track was in the middle of nowhere you know because there was no buildings on the horizon there was no uh nothing blocking the horizon you literally could it looked yeah it looked really like remote really kind of open and really like you say almost spiritual that you were just in the middle of nowhere on this running track Going through, yeah. going through that's why that's that's the only reason to ask about that I, I thought your um your Strava was funny on Instagram as well I think you posted that on it's literally just 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 that I know for ages <laughs> and, then it, and then obviously you can't see it but then it goes that way doesn't it <laughs> there was one uh, yeah. change of direction at 12 hours which that that gave us all a real lift yeah I was talking <laughs> to Sean my my missus last night about this about chatting to you today and what you'd done and she was really concerned. She was like, "Will you have one leg shorter than the other if they've just done it <laughs> like one way?" <laughs> she was some concerned people, that you didn't turn around. <laughs> some people felt the the change of direction. I didn't. And I, the way I explain it is, you're not racing a 400 meter race. You're not leaning into a corner. So you're plodding around the the corner. Um, so, but having said that, some people did feel it in their hips a little bit. They it took them a while to adjust once they'd once they changed direction, but. Uh, it wasn't too much of a problem for me, thankfully. Yeah, when I, I I was just training just before coming back and jumping on the call. I was training uh, uh, Edith, friend of the show. I've mentioned a lot, and we just doing some training. and And I said that we were. I was talking to you this afternoon and what you've done, and um, and yeah, she. I think that's the thing, which will hopefully we, I know we'll talk about during this conversation because she she sort of said, well, you know, I'm sure I don't want to minimise the how much of a physical achievement it is but doing that round a 400 meter track must be that the the mindset the mental resilience the kind of resolve and, and i know that you also said uh in the video you weren't allowed um any headphones or any kind of external stuff going on while you were running so it's really just you and your thoughts and the track 
Um, so I know we'll talk about that. I mean, in terms of your preparation for this one, um, how did you feel when you kind of rocked up to the start and when you when you arrived there? Were you optimistic? Were you confident? Did you think, yeah, this is I'm going to nail it this time? I mean, how, what was your thought process going into it? I felt slightly underprepared. <laughs> and uh, so what I was banking on was that I did a lot of training leading up to my first 100 mile attempt. And the the thing that helps you achieve from a physical perspective, the thing that helps you achieve these long distances is having a good aerobic base. Building an aerobic base takes a long time. It's really quite comparable to the sort of strength training you guys do, like proper strength, not bodybuilding hypertrophy but real strength takes a long time to build up but it kind of lasts a long time as well once you've got true strength and um aerobic fitness is similar so i was banking on the facts that for the first half of this year i really nailed it then i went into that strength block that i spoke to you about and felt great and then suddenly i booked the race and i thought right i'll get back into my running again but i was still kind of enjoying the strength training and then life got busy and um I never quite hit my running training as much as I would like. So about a month out from this track 100, I suddenly got very nervous and I wasn't feeling confident at all. I was just banking on the facts that physically it would have been much easier than the 100 mile I did attempt in terms of the terrain because it was just flat as opposed to hilly. And hopefully I'd built up a, enough of an aerobic base where I wasn't doing no running. I was still still building up. I did a chance of marathon in preparation, ran that as a nice steady training run and ran that in sub four. So that kind of gave me a gave me an idea that, OK, my fitness is OK. I also, what was also good after the chance of marathon was I didn't ache the next day. So I went to work and really felt pretty good. So so that that, that was giving me a little clue that my body was OK, but my numbers in my training volume just were nowhere near what they were earlier in the year so part of my brain was very worried that my numbers weren't there another part of my brain was thinking I actually feel pretty good I can run chumps of marathon in a sub four and feel fine um so that that's not being unfit so um I, I just didn't know how to feel it I didn't feel very certain about the outcome mm. and in terms of strategy because I think you you mentioned uh on on the video that that you you had a kind of a pace in mind that you were going to go out and you you know you you were kind of rigid and you stuck to this pace and you said i think initially there are people kind of everyone was everyone passed you everyone was going running past you and you were just kind of really sticking to this pace that you'd set out so so what was the pace that you decided on um and how difficult did you find it to keep to that pace once you started and once you know, everyone's passing you and you, did you kind of question your strategy or were you, were, you know, were you secure and definite in your mind that this was the right thing that you were doing? So by sheer luck, I listened to a Rich Roll podcast where there was, she, he was interviewing the female world record holder for both track 100 mile and track 24 hour. And she has a strategy. She's really cool to listen to. She had a strategy strategy where she sets her heart rate to 130 beats a minute for the first 80 miles. And then she says she turns into a savage and, uh, <laughs> uh, and she just starts overtaking people. So lots of people are out in front of her for the first 80 miles. And then she just starts overtaking people. I did not pick up pace, <laughs> but, <laughs> but her 130 beats a minute. So the thing that I go by is heart rate. So when you said I stuck to a pace, actually what I was aiming at was a certain heart rate. I use the Maffetone formula and or at least follow Maffetone's philosophy where I think your age is relevant in terms of what heart rate you should be aiming at and it just so happens that the lady that I was listening to on that podcast is a similar age to me so I kind of figured low 130s 130 beats a minute that's probably about right for me uh due to my age and where where I do my zone training can you just and remind people Chris the, the the math the math formula for that so the math formula is a way to figure out the top of your aerobic threshold. The, another way to say that is the top of your zone two. And Dr. Phil Maffetone talks about that being 180 minus your age, plus or minus five either way, depending on how conditioned you are or how much life stress you have going on. And uh, if you're taking any medications, if you have any pre-existing conditions. So, so 180 minus your age, plus a little bit if you're really conditioned and really healthy and have low stress, minus a little bit 
if you're stressed or take medications or have a pre-existing health condition. So that's the top of your aerobic threshold, top of zone two. For something like a 100 mile run where for me, I was expecting coming well over 20 hours for this. I was aiming probably at the top of my zone one, very bottom of my zone two. And that is a pace that I thought would be sustainable as long as I was eating consistently throughout the race. Um, okay, so, like so you say, started off, like you say, on this 130 was the number and you, you were just going to kind of run as slow as you needed to, to, to maintain that for, you know, for as long as possible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I could maintain a fairly consistent pace for about the first 50 to 60 miles, which is where it got interesting because that was daytime. And th that was also the longest I'd ever run before about 11 hours. And uh, so that was the longest I'd ever run in any of my previous ultras. It was daytime. My circadian rhythm felt good with just being upright, moving forwards. The first time it got hard for me was my bedtime when I would normally be asleep all day long. Um, I, I was, I felt good. I remember my watch hitting 50 miles and I, I just remember having a little chuckle to myself thinking, I feel amazingly okay having just covered 50 miles and uh i started to get a little bit deluded um in in um 100 mile running there's a threshold if you can do it in under 24 hours that's pretty good uh i was having delusions that i'd be able to do it in under 20 hours because i felt so good at 50 miles i got this <laughs> completely deluded mindset of like oh wow i'm on for a really good time here the night time's going to be fine <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it turns out it wasn't but um uh, I, up until 50 60 miles i felt great mm. so that, and i think really, it, it was funny because in your video you talk about that and it really resonated with me because i've done i've done a couple of two or three i've done one unsuccessful but a couple of like long walks um i don't i don't necessarily do a lot of running Walk, walking's a lot more civilized in my, in my <laughs> um um but um yeah, as soon as it gets night time, you just want to go to sleep. I was just like, I, and and I, I actually did on one of them. I was I was um, going through kind of um, um, gates, you know, in fences and stuff like that on uh, public footpaths, and and I'd be like resting on the gate like that. So I just put my head on it, and then I'd go, and then I'd come come round again. I must have like gone to sleep for like thirty seconds or something. You know, when you're reading uh -huh. a book in bed and you nod off. I was doing that. And then well, I was apparently... like, I need to keep going. I need to not do that. Otherwise, I'm going to end up falling asleep in the middle of a field somewhere. The world's best female um, ultra runner, Courtney DeWalter, she's recognized to be the goat. And uh, she she talks about the one minute nap. And yeah. she's done this a few times in ultras where when your body really, really needs it, you close your eyes and your body just sucks you in, goes, this is what I need in one minute. And then pops you back out again. And you don't feel amazing, but you feel so much better than you did. Yeah. Uh, I, I, that is a strategy. Did and, you? Oh, <laughs> there you go. I discovered that on my own. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you, I know you said about the, uh, you know, you, you have like a, a picnic chair or a folding chair. You, you can put on the side of the track. You can put spare clothes, a bag, food, all that stuff there. And I suppose any time that you want, you just pop off to your chair and, and, and help yourself. Was there ever a time in the, in the, in the, the 24 hours where you actually went and sat down on the chair or, or did you kind of continually keep moving the whole time? I mean, cause I know that even just, I mean, I've done a, a marathon a number of times, but I know if you actually, even just that distance, if you stop and sit down, uh, getting going is, is really, really tough again after that. I mean, so did you ever sit down and have a break or were you kind of perpetually just keeping moving the whole time? My my strategy going into the race was that I was going to treat myself at midnight to sitting down for five minutes. But then uh, I started to see more and more people sit down. And I, I got chatting to this guy, a really nice guy. And uh, he was saying, oh, my God, you just got to go sit down for two minutes, shake your legs out, and it will really refresh you. <laughs> so um, he, he gave me this idea. And I went and sat down. A little bit later, he dropped out <laughs> because his legs were so sore. So I was like, oh, damn it. We're not really working on the same strategy here i probably shouldn't have been following that advice but um i did i did sit down a few times um i actually know a long ultra long distance or like like 4000 miles level distance uh cyclist 
And he has a, a phrase in ultra, ultra long distance stuff where he says, you should only ever have a five minute break or a 20 minute break. And you go into each break knowing what, what distance, it, what time it's going to be. I never really felt like I deserved a 20 minute break. So I would just go in and, and set myself a time, literally a timer. And five minutes is all I'm going to do is to sit down, scoff some food, shake my legs out and then get back up again. And I did that a few times. Um, mm -hmm. But on your point of getting started again, not only was that true when you're getting up from sitting, but also when you go from a walk to a run, because a, a natural strategy for long distance running at my level, at least is, is to walk occasionally and have a, have a split of walking and running. What I was uh, telling, telling people, we would often be walking together going, Oh, I can't get running about two or three in the morning where your whole body and every cell in your body wants to be asleep. We'd be moping around and they would be saying, I just can't get running. It's so painful. And I was, I kind of created this idea of judge the pain in half a lap. So it is horrible going from walking to running at two in the morning when you've been running for 16 hours, but don't judge it in the first few steps, judge it in half a lap's time. So uh, I, I tried to kind of share that idea with a few people as I was going around that, that that seemed to be a good mindset to have, like judge this on the other side of that track. You see that, see that little tree over there by the time you get to that, you'll feel okay. <laughs> and mm. uh, that, that helped motivate me to get, pick up speed from a walk. In terms of the numbers of people who did this particular race, I, I, how many how many was it that started you did say in the video i think i don't think i meant oh 39 started it 50 yeah. signed up 39 started on they were there on the day and only 18 finished and so 21 dropped out over half dropped out wow. and many of them i mean this is a thing on a track where there's not that many people you get to chat to everyone and also you chat to people as they're leaving and and uh there were good people who have done multiple hundred miles where just the thought of being there through the night it was tipping it down with rain if something was going on in their mind or body it it just got them off the track it, it was really hard yes i mean that's incredible like you say 50 sign up 39 actually so 11 didn't even make the start line you know and mm. then out of those uh 39 18 finished i think you said yeah, yeah that's, i that's came 17th by the way yeah, <laughs> I came seventeenth, pen penultimate last. You picked um, it up at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, but all those, but all those people, you know, all those people who passed you to begin with and and dropped out. It kind of, you know, um, yeah, that's incredible. And it's, it's interesting you say that because I know this is not it's not really comparable, but it is maybe just to make it, um, uh, I suppose, for, applicable for many of our listeners. We've we've spoke before about um when you start a workout or something and the first you know couple of sets or the first couple of reps or the first exercise might not feel great um but it's kind of you you always feel better the more you you the more you do in a set even if it's just a one hour gym workout so it's not a hundred mile race but you know we i often say to people well, you know get started you know do do warm up do some stretching, do some mobility, do the first exercise, and then kind of your body and your mind will warm to the task, you know? Um, so I think that, you know, that's just something that's applicable for, for everybody, not necessarily people who are going to go and do the do the 100 miles. Um, one thing that's really interesting that you that you spoke about, or we've meant on the video, I think, was you got to about 90 miles and you mentioned that you know over 20 20 odd people 21 people pulled out and you were like it sounds like you were as close as you could have possibly been to pulling out and i was the closest so what kind of happened with you yeah what happened with you at that sort of stage that was the closest i've ever come to quitting anything in my life where i then didn't go on to quit and uh, <laughs> it it was uh, so there's, there's a phrase in ultra running that it never always gets worse. You, you tend to go through waves of feeling horrendous. So I, I, my waves were, I felt great for 50 to 60 miles. The first, the daytime, I never really hit a bad spot. That gave me lots of confidence. Then my bedtime came along. I felt pretty horrendous. But then I started to get an uplift about an hour later. So I felt horrendous for an hour, then up again, and I was running pretty well again. Then by about 1.30 to 2 a.m., 
I have that's the point at which I said every cell in my body wanted to be asleep like my deep bones wanted to be asleep Mm. and that continued from 2 2 a.m all the way to 6 a.m there was no up and in hindsight looking back on it it's the middle of the night there shouldn't there's not necessarily going to be an up but when you're in it when you're in two hours of misery three hours of misery four hours of misery and it hasn't come back up again your brain really starts to believe this is never coming back up again this is me done this is actually this is that i i remember going into this everyone said what a mental challenge this was going to be and your my brain was telling me no 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 this is actually physical you you've just gone down from 2 a.m to 6 a.m this is getting worse and worse and worse this isn't a mental challenge this is just your physical body is not able to continue on and all these thoughts were going on in my mind like some people are built for this stuff you're just not tough enough some people are tough enough you're not and call it a day 90 miles is all right you this has been a good training run you're just not a 100 mile runner and and honestly if i did quit at that moment i don't think i would have tried again i think i i think i would have proven my point that i'm not a 100 mile runner um so the the negative chat was just getting stronger and stronger and stronger in my mind and it just felt so real that this was a physical barrier that I couldn't continue on through. My body felt knackered. There was another thread to this negative chat, which is there was a time cap on the run. And I was trying to do maths in my head, but my brain didn't work. And the negative state of mind I was in was telling me I wasn't going to finish within the time cap. So I might as well quit now. What are you doing here? Just go home, start the recovery process, go home, see your kids. Um you, you can't do this is what my brain was telling me what was the time cap that just out of interest for the 100 25 hours 25 hours okay cool yeah and i was trying to work out earlier so so a 400 meter track is it around it's around 400 time it's 400 times around the track is that what it is 403 yeah okay. so, that, so they actually yeah. do it by laps as opposed to distance because um like my watch told me i'd run 103 104 miles because of all the deviations obviously there's a little bit of inconsistency with the gps but um also all the deviations to the outside edge and not quite taking the inside line so i ran probably 103 104 miles but they do it by by it being 403 laps mm. wow I've, I've got a question so because I, I did a walk once where i just got the train from bath to cheltenham and then walked back along the Cotswolds Way. It was like 72 miles or something. It took us 30 hours. But I had to get home. There was like, you know, I couldn't just stop because I had mm-hmm. to get home. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's not really many train stations kicking around on the Cotswolds Way. <laughs> yeah. um, but I did another one. There's a This was two years ago. And there's a, a walking bath called the Skyline. And I figured out that 17 times around the Skyline is about 100 miles. Um, and... It was 17 years at the time since my dad had died of cancer. So I was like, I'll do it for cancer charity. I'll do it for local cancer um, place, Dorothy House. And I'll raise money for that and all that. So I did it 17 times. But it's that one was totally different because I could have stopped at any moment because it's it's literally, it's just there. So I could have just gone, all mm. right, I'll, I'm, I'm finished now. But, you, but it's harder to do that. So on the track, obviously, it's totally different because you can stop whenever you like. But when you're doing a, an ultra, you have to keep going, right? But... My my thing was what made you so. For me, it was people are. I'm I, I raised a decent amount of money. I was like, I have to finish this. <laughs> it's like because like people have people have put their money on this and, and kind of bet on me to do it sort of thing. So I've got to do it. But what like you weren't doing it for charity or anything. So at ninety miles, when you wanted to give up, what what was it that said no? You've got to finish. Like what actually? What made you do it? <laughs> It's a, it's a really interesting question that the, there's another phrase in ultra running that you experience a lifetime of emotion in a day. And, and it's, a, it's so true The the emotions are so strong and the thoughts are so strong. Um, there was just a little bit of me that knew I wasn't completely done. I knew that I could put one foot forwards. And that's something I'm questioning back about the DNF that did not finish back in June. 
I wasn't completely done then either. But that particular day, there were a few things going on. It was the hottest day of the year at the time. It in my head, when things go terribly wrong, catastrophically wrong in long distance events, it's on very hot days. So I, there was a little bit of me that just wanted to be safe that day. Um, but when I quit, I could have put another step forwards. And uh, on this particular time, I just wanted to see what happens if I gave it everything and uh, and fully committed. My wife was texting me at the time and sending me messages from the kids. And, and that was just something where it, that was a real strong motivator. Like I'm trying to be something for them. And that, I guess, was in the back of my mind. Uh, but the true answer to your question is, I don't know. I don't know. I would have loved to have quit. Because <laughs> and... you didn't, you actually, you you kind of walked over to like the officials and stuff and you were going to, because I presume all you have to do is, is walk over and say, right, I'm, 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 I've had enough. I'm, I'm giving up. And you, you, you know, you hand in your chip or whatever it is, or, you know, and you just, you just stop. Um, so I think you, you actually walked over and you were going to do that, weren't you? You were that I, close to, to yeah, doing it. I knew, I knew I was going to make a YouTube video. I'd filmed, I was walking around the back edge of the track. And that was the next thing was the cabin where the crew were. And I was walking around the back edge and I'd filmed a, uh, this is 90 miles. This is me done. I don't have the hundred in me. And uh, that was genuinely, I'm on my way to quit. And I got there and I put my hands on my knees and I was just thinking, and I still couldn't do the maths. It still felt real that I wouldn't have finished in the time cap. But there was this voice going, you're just not completely done, are you? This isn't, you came here to find a limit. This isn't a limit. It, whatever's going on isn't your limit just try just give it everything and then at least if you've given it everything and you still fail you've given it everything that was that was a little voice um i heard maybe this is from the chimp paradox or another book the the an analogy for the the conversation between the subconscious and the conscious and and uh someone said it's it's like a little boy trying to tame a wild elephant. So, so the, the positive voice in my my mind was a little boy, and the negative chat was this wild elephant rampaging through my brain. So, so there, there was so much negativity, and it was so strong. But there was this little voice going, "Yeah, but you're not done." So, uh, so something else I'd said before this was I've heard David Goggins quote the seals phrase which is the navy seals which is um when you think you're done you're only 40 percent done and I, i've done seven or eight ultras prior to this and i could honestly say i've never even hit the 40 percent i think that point for me at 90 miles where i thought i was done that was probably the 40 percent that he's talking about that it felt so real at 90 then this I, my wife was messaging me I had this moment where I was standing there with my hands on my knees and I just realized I'm not completely done I need to commit I need to try once I came to that conclusion and I started trying I started to pick up pace um, then I started to feel quite a bit better then after four hours I got the up that I'd been hoping for and a few a couple of other things tied in with that the sun started to rise the light gave me energy that made my tummy rumble I hadn't been able to eat that much through the night because of um probably my circadian rhythm just saying you shouldn't be eating so uh, I I took another two minute sit down just to scoff as much food as I could scoff in in two minutes so that I had um extra energy for the next nine eight or nine miles and that gave me more energy so uh it, it all started with the decision you've got to commit to this you've got to try every, try your hardest you haven't tried your hardest yet and then sun sunlight helped food helped and actually at 100 miles when i did eventually cross the finish line i felt so much better than at 90 miles <laughs> this was this was going to be a i mean that that um you know, the boy taming the elephant thing, that's David versus Goliath, isn't it? It's like, it's age old, that sort of stuff, isn't it? It's like, you know, it's been around, you know, I've, I've looked at back through loads of like, you know, old religions and philosophies and stuff like that. And it's all like similar, like similar stories, isn't it? Of, you know, similar philosophies that have just gone in different tangents, I think. So David versus Goliath is a big one on that. But the, I was going to ask you about the food because 
because again, at night, you're just doing what you, your body's like, what are you doing? Go to sleep. So mm-hmm. how did that show up? And did it take you back to the last one you you said? Because because on the last one you said you were um you had a 400 calories an hour or whatever it was, 350, 400 calories an hour. But after a certain amount of time, you couldn't get any more in because it just wasn't, because your body wasn't accepting it. Mm. And did that take your brain straight back to that, that time and go, oh, this has happened before. What do I do now? Sort of thing. It did a bit. Yeah, it did. It did cross my mind that, oh, oh God, this is what happened to me last time. I couldn't take on food. At the same time, it never became too much of a stress. It it just felt like, oh God, I just can't eat. And um, it's the nighttime that's done this to me. In hindsight, I should have done some nighttime training. I think it's trainable. I just didn't do any because I like my sleep too much. <laughs> and um, I, I just, who would go out running at two in the morning if they don't have to. So um, I uh, I hadn't done any nighttime training in hindsight. That was a mistake. If I wanted to do really well in this race and push a bit for a faster time and a better, more optimized strategy, I would have done some nighttime training at two or three times, gone out after a day's work and gone out trying to, trying to eat and, as always with ultra distance running, you're training your gut to take on food and certain types of food while you're running just as much as you're training, you're running. So, um, in, like I say, in hindsight, if I have, uh, another hundred mile race where I care more about my time and my position or just want to increase my chances of finishing, I, I will do some nighttime training and really specifically focus on eating consistently through a nighttime run. I, I think it's probably trainable, but, it was so powerful the the feeling of the circadian rhythm uh, just my cells were did not they did not want me to be moving and they did not want me to take on food this is this is what's massive i mean it's a broader subject that because obviously you know a lot of our listeners will be you know people who want to lose weight and and get a bit fitter and a bit healthier and all of that but not necessarily go to bed at a reasonable time and be you know midnight snacking and stuff like that so it's it's really interesting that you can be at your peak, um, like kind of performance, um, capability. That's the word I was looking for. So you're at your kind of peak performance capability, and you're going to test that. And it's still like that. That that like for someone who's not at their peak performance, nowhere near it. Who was who's just about getting off the sofa. This is all affecting them as well, and just changing those sorts of things of going to bed early, drinking more water eating proper food to fuel you and, and all of that sort of stuff. It makes this kind of exacerbates that because as soon as you were able to eat again, as soon as the sun came up, you know, sunlight before screen light and all that Huberman goes on about that all the time. Doesn't it? As soon as that happened and you were able to get that food on board, you said like, you know, by the time you got to hundred miles, you felt better than you did at 90. So it's, um, that's just like on a broader kind of, um, way of thinking of it. That's, that's the way my brain works anyway. I was just going to ask Chris, with uh, in regards to at ninety, you 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 know, like you say, your brain wasn't functioning properly, and you were you were doing the maths, and you worked out I can't finish in the time. What what actually happened once you started moving again, and maybe the sun came up, and you had something to eat? Did you recalculate and work out actually I can finish in time? I just I'd work I'd calculated incorrectly or. And then that gave you because you obviously you must have had some hope of success and hope of being yeah. able to do it. And then the hope would pull you forwards and, and help you through those last 10 miles. Um, yeah. What happened with that? Did you recalculate and work out you'd you'd made a mistake and you could do it? Exactly that. And um, what I've realized is when when people say something is a mental challenge. I, I knew going into this race, it was going to be a tough mental day out. But what I didn't really know is how that presents itself. What does what does a tough mental challenge feel like? Because actually what a tough mental challenge feels like is it feels physical or the math, the, uh, me not being able to do the maths and think that I was going to DNF at the end, I might as well DNF now. That was just another trick my brain was playing. That that's part of the the mental challenge is to realize, yeah, that's just a trick your brain is playing. So um the fact that I couldn't do the maths and I kept thinking I was gonna fail, that was all wildly wrong. I ended up finishing in uh 
24 hours 22 minutes so I had well over half an hour to spare so um, I, I did I did pick up the pace I did pick up the pace but I didn't pick it up like half an hour difference it was just my brain giving me an excuse to quit and mm. uh, all of these reasons that were coming in the facts that my physical body just felt completely battered the facts that just the track was so miserable I needed to get off that track the facts that I wasn't going to finish in 25 hours it they were all just things that my brain was doing to me to try and make me quit. Mm. I mean, that's huge, isn't it? Because loads of people have thoughts all the time and then they believe them and that's it. And it stops them mm. doing what they want. And it's like, well, if, if you just don't believe them, what happens if you, because that's the thing when you were saying you were trying to figure it all out in there, that's using up more energy, obviously you're making you more tired, but also it doesn't matter. You just keep going, right? Because it'll be what it'll be at the end. You might have done 99 miles, but it's better than 90 in it <laughs> so... that's the conclusion once I committed I could, once I was standing there with my hands on my knees and that voice just went you're not completely done you've got to try even though other voices more negative voices were louder that that was the conclusion I came to I just got to try and uh, I'm just so pleased I did and I'm 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 so pleased I did do the 100 but even if I didn't say I came in like say at 98 miles I would have, that's fine. I would have felt so different about the whole event than if I quit at 90. If I'd have come in, if I'd have kept running till 25 hours, really tried my best and I did 98 miles. Well, that's pretty good. That, that's a good day out. Um, the fact that I didn't quit is really what matters to me the most. We mm. had um, we had David Keown on, um, who's a stone lifter these days, but he when he was a kettlebell sport athlete, you know, they're using 232s, long cycle, um and he was saying that you got massive respect especially from the russians as well if you manage the full 10 minutes doesn't matter how many reps you got you could just stand there holding the bells just like i'm gonna die but like as long as you got mm -hmm. to the 10 minutes that was what mattered not the amount of reps so i suppose it's kind of similar to that you complete the the 25 hours and you've yeah. done a certain amount it doesn't matter yeah. if you complete the 100 it's like you've just you've 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 dug deep and got right to the end. So yeah. yeah, there's a race in America, which I think is Western States. I might have it wrong. And the race finishes on a, on a running track and they call the final hour, the golden hour and all of the winners or everyone who's run the race, all of their friends and family come and surround the track for the people that come in. I think there's a 30 hour time cap. So they all get there at hour 29 and they just cheer these people in. And there are there are people who are coming in at 29 hours, 50 minutes, 29 hours, 55, 29 hours, 59. And they're just cheering people in. Then there's a few people that don't quite make it. They haven't technically run the run, but they're still getting cheered in because that that's just, I mean, it's amazing that some people can finish that race in 18 hours compared to 30. But it's so amazing that some people are just trying and keeping on going, keeping on going for the full time cap and, and not giving up. And it, I, thought, it's, uh, I thought you were going to say they're cheering everyone coming in. And then as soon as it gets to 30 hours, they just go. That'd be brilliant. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. We had um week before last, we had a guy on uh, Anthony Flores from uh, from the States. And one of the quotes that I, I shared the other day that he he sort of said was um, uh, stop listening to yourself and start talking to yourself. And he kind of, and he spoke about, and it's, it's a similar, another way of, of describing that all those, the kind of the negative voices or the negative voice, the overwhelming negative voice that's coming in at you. It's kind of so many people, they hear that voice. And I mean, especially the way that you were at 90 miles, having that negative voice, the amount of willpower to, to kind of, to stand up to that voice, I suppose. Do you do you feel that do you feel that was that a subconscious voice was the negative voice, and was it another kind of subconscious voice that the the little boy that was talking you out of quitting, or were you consciously trying to, you know, overpower the the negative voice? What what do you think was going on in your brain there? It it feels like the negative was subconscious. And I, there was a little bit of conscious power left to try Trying and to... Talk, talk myself back into it. Yeah. Um, but I've I felt since the race, I've had such, I call it an afterglow. I've had such a sense of achievement. I'm so pleased I did it. And the, 
the lessons in this 100 mile, they were so stark and they sound very specific lessons. They sound very specific to running a hundred miles around a track is a very weird thing to do, but the, it's a very niche thing, but the lessons you learn just carry over into everything. And, and this is probably the biggest, the two biggest lessons I've taken are one is um, your barriers aren't real. They will present in a quite in a real way they will present as a physical limitation they'll present as a maths problem like you don't have the time to do this um and actually you you prob they're, they're just illusions um and and then the other lesson i've had is just how the, ne the negative chat is is just a story that your mind creates probably to try and protect you and you need to harness something find that positivity and then just try and ignite ignite that I think by doing very hard challenges from time to time, no matter what it is, um, physical endeavors help teach you this stuff. And then it carries over into other areas of your life. Like running a business is hard. Being a parent is hard. <laughs> Being alive in the modern world is hard. So when we do really hard things in an acute format, a, sh a sharp, short, short, sharp format, we then learn the lessons that actually carry over into the more chronic format of just being alive. And uh, the, I think these lessons, because they're so exaggerated in these physical endeavors, then your day-to-day -day life is, oh, well, I ran 100 miles last week. <laughs> it's not going to be that yeah. bad. Yeah. And, um, that's, that's really interesting because it's one of those things as well. If, if you try and explain it to somebody, not, not, it's not even like running 100 miles, but just doing something to test yourself in that way. And then try and explain it to somebody. They don't, it's it's really hard to explain. That's why I asked that question of like, what kept you going at 90 miles? And you're like, I don't know. I just did it. It's it it it, it and the, there'll be a reason deep down somewhere, but you, you just can't quite grasp it, but it's there. And trying to explain that to somebody is really difficult rather than just saying, just go and do it. Just go and do something that you're really uncomfortable with and just go and do it. And then you and then tell me. And it's one of those, it'll be one of those things, I think, where the person would then come back and go, I know what you mean, right? Explain it to me. I can't, but now we understand each other sort of things. You know what I mean? I definitely I'm, I'm asking if you know what I mean, but that will be one, might be one of those things that, yeah, but I can't explain it. <laughs> so so one, one thing I would say to people starting out is your mindset is trainable in the same way your physical body is trainable. I've had many people say to me, there's no way I could do that. I'm not mentally tough enough. And, and I say, I know it's because you haven't tried yet <laughs> and yeah. you, you haven't done the 5k. And when you get to your 5k, you do your 10k. And when you, do, and if we use a running example, it could be anything, but if we're using a running example, once you got your 10k, you might want to try a half marathon. By the time you start going up the distance, every single next step is scary and you just about cope with it. While you're coping with that, you also learn nutrition strategies. You learn training strategies. You learn recovery strategies sometimes you get it wrong and when you make mistakes that hurts and then you learn something about how you deal with pain and discomfort and you have to solve problems and that will teach you and give you more mental resilience i'm it failed earlier this year this was my second hundred mile attempt i learned so much that first time so um for someone to listen to someone who's ahead of them in the journey they may it's easy for them to think i can't do that i'm not tough enough and uh and of course, that's okay, because you haven't built up gradually bit by bit. And you you build your mental toughness as you build your physical fitness, and you build your training strategies, and you build your recovery strategy, they all grow together. So um, never be put off by or never feel inferior to people who are slightly further ahead in the journey. The other thing to remember is I did achieve the 100 miles, and I didn't feel tough enough. <laughs> and well, even... that, on a, that mental thing, when you say people say, oh, I haven't, I haven't got the mental toughness to do that, there's a thing, like a, a group I'm part of, and they, they talk about, like, you know, the story you tell is the truth you know. Like, if you tell that, you won't be mentally strong enough. However, if you flip that story and say, well, I am, then you will be. So using me as an example, I think I'm mentally tough enough to run 100 miles or at least go for it and all that sort of stuff. I just don't want to. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's the other thing, isn't it? A lot of people will say, I could never do that or I'm yeah. not mentally tough enough just so they don't have to, you know, be uh, um, almost like uh, to shut that possibility off. Because like you say, it's a niche thing that is 
and it is i'm going to say chris it's 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 pretty weird you know to to run to go and run 100 miles around a 400 meter track you know not many people there must be you know it's probably 0.0000001 of the population would do something like that but like you say it's not really about about the running 100 miles around the four the 400 meter track is it it's about gradually progressing and gradually expanding your horizons and what you and I, and I think that one of the biggest things is that now w- one of the big reasons I wanted to get you back on was because I think it's such a brilliant story and it's such a in, inspiring and empowering story of you you did try and do this and it didn't work out and you've gone back and you've done it and now you now now you've done it but now that you've done it once I dare say if you were to go and do another 100 miler or 150 miler or whatever the next challenge is going to be, which we'll ask about in a minute. um, You've got that belief that, you know, Mm -hmm. you can do it. So when you approach it next time, it's going to be different, isn't it? You've, you've kind of, you know, you can do it now, which is, which again is a massive confidence booster for for life and for these sort of things going forwards. Yeah. That, Honestly, that moment at 90 miles was really quite a profound thing for me and to push through the, I, I feel more gratitude for pushing through at 90 miles than I do for finishing the hundred and saying I've run a hundred miles like that, pushing through what felt like such a real barrier at the time to then move on a little bit longer and then feel, oh, I'm actually all right. And, and to have such a long period of time from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. where I was just progressively getting worse and worse to the point where, oh, this must be real. This isn't coming back up again, but then to come out the other side, that that is such a good lesson to have that there's just there just is more in the tank. And sometimes bad times do last quite a long time, but just keep going. If you're not done, done, then you can keep going. Uh, that that was a really powerful lesson that will, will certainly help me in future endeavors. I, I have been left with a paradox though, because now I'm a couple of weeks out of the the event. I'm I've already got rose tinted glasses about it. I've over I've already I've already forgotten how bad that was at four to six a.m. Um, but what I was saying at the time when it was fresh was, God, that was so miserable, so miserable. But I literally cried tears of joy on the finish line because it was so miserable because it was so hard and the barrier felt so real but I got through I was crying on the finish line which has never happened before and I've never felt so joyful because things have never been so hard so so the real paradox is do I want the nice daytime ultras where you're out for 10 11 hours and you do you do your hard run it's still not easy but you do your hard run then you get back to your hotel and you go to bed Or do I want the really tough, miserable, really dark times? Uh, But then if you can get through them, you cry tears of joy in the finish line. So, so um, I'm still, still deciding what, what's next and where I want to go with it. Excellent. So what's that's the interesting because it seems it seems like you get more out of the dark ones, doesn't it? But it's like, oh, really? <laughs> I know. <laughs> you Although just have you to said... go to hell and back, don't you, to get, well, out, get the joy? James, yeah. James said you're a bit weird, but what's we were talking about before we started recording? I don't know if James was going to get to this, but there's that other one, isn't there? The tunnel. Oh yeah. That's for proper so, weirdos, isn't it? So from the same race director who this race director mark cockbane he's well known for trying to get you stuck in your head so that's why you on this race you weren't allowed headphones you weren't allowed a crew and he's also developed a race called the tunnel which is 200 miles in a tunnel which is a half mile tunnel and uh you do 400 up down through the tunnel um which would be a really i must admit I'm intrigued by it. <laughs> I was going to ask: Is that is there is there somewhere in the dark, in the deep recesses of your mind that thinks, oh, I'd, I'd quite fancy giving that a go at some stage? Is, is there a time cap on that one? I, there is, and I can't remember what it is. Fifty hours or something, which is is not slow. So I, I, I can't, was going to no, say because that's double. It's not like like you were saying you got to fifty miles and you're like oh I could do it in less than twenty. It's like people who do a half marathon and go, well, I did it in less than two hours, so I could do a marathon in four hours. That's maybe like maybe fifty four hours. One hundred and two hundred miles is like it's huge. <laughs> it is. I I can't remember the time cap. Don't quote me on it. It might be fifty four or something. But um, it I I've I've been interested in meditation for a long time, and I've been interested in the nature of mind, 
and I, I really do use physical endeavors to teach me about my mind and my spirit and that's that is where 200 miles in a tunnel or 100 miles around the track that it intrigues me I also love having the fitness to explore big parts of nature I love running in the mountains I love looking at the beautiful vistas of nature but with something like a track or a tunnel you take that away there's only one thing left to explore and that's the nature of your mm. consciousness and and I, I found I find that interesting and have done for a long time with meditation as well so maybe that's why I'm drawn to these things because I wonder if yeah because if you actually thought that and, and I know it would be different because you've done it now once and you know you can, but getting to the end of a hundred mile run that you just did and then thinking you had to start all over again and do another hundred at the end of the first time. I know, I know you frame the mind differently because you, you know, you, 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 you kind of, you, you frame it differently because you know, you're going to do 200 before you start. Um, and effectively, when you get to the hundred mile mark, it's the same as getting to the fifty mile mark on the hundred. Mm. But it's still that it, that is a that, it, that <laughs> you can never you can never say how you're going to feel. But what I was surprised about in the track one hundred is the track one hundred is very much a numbers game. I even had a clicker that I was counting, so I, I didn't. I looked at my clicker more than I looked at my watch, and I knew that I had to do four hundred and three laps. Going into the run, I didn't know whether the clicker and the numbers were going to be motivating or were they going to be scary? Like if I've just clicked lap 80 and I'm thinking, God, I've got 320 to go. Um, how was I going to feel about that? What was interesting was at no point did I really care. <laughs> at no point did I actually care about numbers 50 miles. I guess I had a little glance to go, oh, yeah, 10 hours. That's a pretty good time uh, if I double that. So I was thinking about it, but it didn't. I was thinking quite neutrally about it. It didn't scare me, but it didn't really uplift me. Um, there was no point where the numbers really mattered. And having judged how I felt during the track 100, I would guess uh, that during a tunnel 200, you're just thinking, how am I going to keep moving forwards until I'm done? And that's that's uh, how I felt. So, so um, uh, this is also true at 90 miles. I didn't think it's only 10 miles left. I was thinking... This is how I feel right now. I can't do it. it. The numbers didn't affect me the way I thought they would. So uh, who knows with a different race and a different environment, but I would guess the track, sorry, the tunnel, the 200, it would just be a, well, you're not finished yet. Keep going. Hmm. What country is that in the tunnel? Is that in this country or? Yeah, it's in this country. I can't remember where. Midlands, yeah, yeah. I think. Right. Okay. Wow. Wow. Um, what we'll do, uh, Chris, we'll start to, to wrap up. I mean, it has been incredible. And it, it really made me think when you were talking about being stopping with the hands on the knees and you were literally seconds away from kind of throwing in the towel, as it were, it made me think of the the old Rocky movies, you know, like after he's been knocked down and he's on the canvas and then you get all these kind of, I suppose, what goes through his mind and, and you know, different things from his past coming up. And then he causes him just to stand up and carry on. You know, it really just felt like uh you know that and then when like you say when you made the decision of i'm not quitting i'm going to go on you immediately the second almost you made that decision you started to move again and you you you, you know you almost started to feel better because you'd made that decision to carry on but i mean mm -hmm. yeah it, it's been incredible just hearing i, I suppose it's, it's more, more like you say more the more than the physical the, the the journey that you went on mentally emotionally spiritually everything over the course of that 20 24 hours and 20 22 minutes i think you said uh yeah, yeah it's incredible um pete have you got anything you'd like to say as we kind of wrap up i i just think this has been brilliant because the three episodes we've done with you chris have been great because we didn't know any of this was going to happen right so it was like the first episode you were like yeah I'd, i like going running and uh i've got into ultra marathon running and i've been doing some long runs and that and I'm going to do a hundred miles. Yeah, I think we we're going then... to talk about a bit of rehabby stuff, weren't we? And then... <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Oh, he's a physio, isn't he? He's like, yeah, yeah. We'll talk about yeah. that. But no, exactly. So that's what I love about doing this podcast. It goes anywhere. But then this has turned into like a, an amazing story, and it's like yeah. it's like like we've been watching it unfold, and it's I just love it. I love it. So thank you very much. <laughs> uh, it's been it's been um honestly it's been an interesting it's been interesting being. The, playing out this story this year this this calendar year to have really tried my hardest to have failed on the first attempt to have thought i'd leave it for a while to walk into a coffee shop 
to not really train quite as optimally as I would have hoped to turn up a bit underprepared, but actually feeling pretty good and then to do it. And um, it, it's been, it's been really cool. Do you ever say to the missus, I'm just going to nip out and get a coffee. She's like, stop there. I'll make you one. <laughs> <You're not doing laughs> <anything. laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. Um, Chris, you were saying just before we, um, we came on that you're, you know, you're, you're putting quite a lot of effort at the moment into your YouTube and, and things like that, which is where we saw this, this great video you just put out a couple of days ago. Um, so if people do want to, I mean, there's obviously different avenues and stuff for people, but if, if YouTube is something that you're focusing on a bit at the moment, what's, uh, what, what's your YouTube for people to, to go? Cause you, your videos you put out are fantastic. I mean, I'll say, you know, they're really, really thoughtfully done, really well produced, look great. They're really interesting, uh, really well done. So, so, I mean, what, what's your YouTube for people to follow? Thank you. Um, YouTube is Chris Branch and uh, just search Chris Branch. You'll find me uh, that I'm trying to share information to help people get into running and to run a bit further. That That's including I share my adventures. So if I ever do something big, I put that there, but I also share tips and strategies in my other videos uh, to contact me. You can get, get in touch through Instagram and it's Chris underscore branch underscore. And uh, that, that, they're my two platforms that I really pay attention to. But YouTube is where I'm putting the most effort in, in terms of production value and trying to share ideas to help people. I've got, I've got one. It's not a criticism. Go for it. Right. You did a hundred mile run and all of that. We've just had a chat about it and there's even more we could talk about it. And you did an eight minute video on it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you could do a lot of <laughs> people's attention spans unfortunately uh, well yeah, yeah gotta... well it's just it's just funny you kind of condensed it all in eight minutes and we just had a massive chat about it which has opened up all these other avenues that you could talk about so yeah my, one of my next you... videos i've got two videos in the pipeline one that's being edited right now called five reasons you can't run further so that's going to help people build up their distance and then the next video is going to be things i wish i knew before running 100 miles and uh, it's going to go talk about my journey from DNFing to completing it and things I wish I knew, some of which we haven't actually spoken about today because uh, they just they were on a bit of a tangent. But um, there are some things that in hindsight could have really helped me the first time round, which I didn't know. And now I do. So um, th there will be more to talk about from that 100 mile that will be coming out in future videos. Good. <laughs> I know that we we had um Mark Lewis on, didn't we? What I was just thinking actually. Oh, did you? Probably. Yeah, we should. I was just. I was. It was funny. I was thinking the other day we should maybe try and catch up with uh, with Mark Lewis. But we did a double episode with him, and he's yeah. Just the, the way your videos are done, and the kind of the way your your YouTube channel is is obviously growing and is building. I mean, he's obviously really prolific on YouTube, isn't he? And um, he's been doing it for quite a while now and has really got a massive reach and everything else. But yeah, it just kind of reminded me the quality, you know, the the, the quality of production and everything you're putting into your videos sort of reminded me of, of the stuff that Mark Lewis does, which well, is, uh, yeah, he's an Mark, interesting guy. Mark Lewis is an inspiration for me from both a health perspective and, uh, and a YouTube perspective. Uh, you may, although we've got different setups, he, his videos are talking head and breaking down what he's done and and that i've been inspired by that that's how i've been modeling my my videos so yeah i'll, I'll listen i'll go back and listen to his episode yeah i was gonna say go back because we had a quite a long conversation with him and i think we split it into two episodes because he was on with us for a couple of hours i think but he was yeah he was really good so that's great nice. so, but no well done the videos are fantastic and like i say highly recommend people you know certainly subscribe to the youtube channel and like you say check out instagram as well so um no thank you um yeah thanks everyone for listening guys i mean this is uh this is fantastic we've got next week episode 172 i think we joined we've got another another kind of um two guest one we've got dan john and tim anderson on with us next week um you're looking pete that is correct isn't it i thought you were looking <laughs> we've got dan oh. john Oh, okay. <laughs> we've got dan john and uh, tim anderson on next week uh with us so dan obviously i think it'll be his seventh visit with us and uh and tim it'll be tim from original strength it'll be his second time with us but they're coming over to uh to england next year together 
uh, to do something. So they're going to be on with us next week talking. But thank you so much again for, you know, for, for listening. We really appreciate it. And like I say, we do have some new listeners and watchers who have uh, joined us recently. So um, welcome to everyone who is, is new to the podcast. And um, please do like, share, subscribe, leave a review if you're watching or listening on a platform that allows you to do so. Please do. I mean, we'd like to get some more YouTube subscribers as well. So go onto YouTube, give us a subscribe and go on to healthoddity.com to check out every single episode, all 171 episodes in visual and audio. We will, I'm sure, catch up with Chris again in the future and we'll certainly have him back on when he's done the 200 mile tunnel <laughs> <laughs> down the line. Thanks so much, Chris. Thanks, guys. It's been a real pleasure. I've enjoyed all three of them. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Pete. And we will see you next week with uh, Dan and Tim. Bye-bye.